In a world so populated with impossible, where people would tell you that you can't, what if? What if you take the chance to go after your dreams, to choose a path of impossible over easy? Sure it's hard, sure it takes risks, and you may fail, but what if you didn't? What if you succeed and make a change in this world? Think of all the lives that you can help. In a world full of talk, what if you choose to forge your own truth through discipline? Discipline to face the impossible when so many say you can't. Life was never meant to be easy. Mistakes, failures, it will all happen to us. But what if you decide to get up after each fall to build strength where you were once weak? What if in the span between birth and death that you choose to make a difference in this world? by living with a code. In a world so popular with hate, what if? What if you choose to be something more? I said, help me welcome to the stage a real life angel, a real life badass, Mr. Two Brothers Man. Gazimus lies dead. <laughs> yes, it is so great to be here. Thank you. My wife and I flew in from Colorado, and it's great to be here in Utah. So thank you for welcoming us. So a little bit about myself. <clears throat> a little bit about myself. My wife and I run a company called Ronin Tactics where I travel around the United States teaching military, law enforcement, law-abiding citizens. I teach anything from hand-to-hand -hand combat, blade tactics, firearms, close quarters battle. We are a recognized brand within the tactical industry where I can take my 23 years of military experience and with my wife, able to design, engineer, manufacture, and distribute tactical gear to the military, law enforcement, and civilian sectors. I am an entrepreneur, a loving husband, and a Sanji warrior teacher to many. Today, I want to share with you how overcoming adversity and engaging in a life of purpose can lead you to your authentic truth and create a life of your highest potential. The reason why I'm telling you all this is because my story is one of escape, survival, acceptance. But it was through my pain was how I found my purpose. Purpose is found through pain, right? I mean, how else is you going to find your purpose? Everybody says, find your purpose, but how? See, my purpose was found through my pain. Every successful person I know has faced some kind of hardships. I don't care if you're rich or poor, you come from a loving or broken household. We all will face our hardships. But what is purpose but to take the pain from our hardship and turn into something more? Strength can only be forged by first knowing what it means to be weak. Today, I want you to just take a moment and reflect on your own individual pain. It could be something that you're currently facing, or pain from unresolved traumas from your past. Let this pain be present. And together, let's form a new narrative of why this pain is necessary. Mm. 
for a majority of us, pain comes to us at a young age through the conditions of our upbringing. Maybe you were raised around abusive parents, grew up in a substance abuse home. Too often for most of us, pain, too often for most of us, abuse at a young age could be crippling and cause a pattern of destructive behaviors throughout the rest of our lives. But what if I tell you that pain can be such a powerful ally? Today I want to share with you how I was able to take my pain and turn it into purpose. A purpose driven by the code of samurai. Nietzsche, a German philosopher once said that still chaos is needed in oneself to give birth to a dancing star. See, without chaos, you'll never have the pain that guides the purpose. I was born in chaos. I was born in war on a cold cement floor in the basement of Saigon Hospital. My mother shielded my body from incoming artillery fire mourning my birth. At this stage of the war, American troops had left Vietnam, and I was born on the losing side of war. At three months old, I lost my freedoms, and we lived underneath communist oppression. My uncles, that served alongside Americans were immediately brought out to the re-education camps. These were torture camps. Prisoners were forced into harsh manual labor. And if anybody feels sick or ill due to these harsh living conditions, were brought out to the jungles and quietly murdered. Like the battlefields of Afghanistan, people have died trying to leave any means possible. After the fall of South Vietnam, people left on government planes. Some walked out to neighboring countries, knowing that these jungles were riddled with landmines. As for my family, we escaped by sea. We were later known in history as the boat people. There was an estimated 400,000 refugees died at sea. There we were, loaded up on the bottom deck of a wooden fishing boat. To escape Vietnam by sea, First, we had to get past the military guards that would patrol the coast for fleeing refugees. Any refugees that were caught were immediately separated and brought out to the re-education camps. Next, we had to get past the pirates from surrounding countries of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. These criminals would forcefully stop the boats knowing that the refugees were fleeing with everything they had on them. They would board the boats, kill the men, rape the women, and enslave the children. Such a lucrative business that it brought in more pirates from surrounding countries. The typhoon strength of a tropical storm in the South China Sea has claimed the lives of thousands of refugees. And somehow, we navigated past all that. And we made our way into Malaysia, 
where the Malaysian Coast Guard stopped us at gunpoint. They were not accepting any more refugees. They forcibly roped our boat and drugged us back out into the South China Sea. And then when there was no more sight of land or hope, they cut the line, shot the motor, and left us there to die. We drifted for nearly 30 days. Lack of food and water, the dead was thrown overboard. It was common practice amongst fleeing refugees to carry poison within their belongings. See, this poison was to be administered to the children once the journey ends for us so that we may not die a painful death. And as the days turn into weeks, my mother held on to the one thing that this physical life cannot take away from us. And that's our faith. She held on to the faith for one more day. Until one day, our boat got caught up in a huge tropical storm. My mother said the storm was so massive that our boat should have capsized. And somehow this storm washed us further out into the unknown of the South China Sea. And to eventually, we were saved by a passing Russian supply boat. Can you imagine? A huge tropical storm Washing us into the safety of a rescue? By the grace of God, we were saved. Only to endure one and a half years in the Indonesian refugee camps. Thousands have died of starvation and disease. And when my parents finally made it to the land of the free, we were spit on, flicked off, called by many racist names, was told to go back home to our country. The thing was, we didn't have a country. My parents lost their freedoms and everything they had and had to start over in a new country that didn't even accept us. We uh, eventually settled in in a town called Fayetteville. It's a military town right outside of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Fort Bragg is one of the biggest army bases in all of America. There was a huge sign that read, Fort Bragg, home to 82nd Airborne and Special Operation Forces. When we first moved into Fayetteville, my family and I lived in a very poor part of town. We lived in a one bedroom apartment and the only furniture that we had was one used full-size mattress that my whole family slept on. My brother and I would wear hand-me-down refugee clothes. My mother would stay up late at night repairing the holes in the clothes and shoes so that my brother and I could go to school. Going to school as a Vietnamese refugee was extremely difficult. 
I would often get picked on and separated from my peers. You see, the Vietnam War was an unpopular war, and I was the face of this unpopular war. I felt the hate from my peers, their parents, some of my teachers. But this all changed when I was eight years old. My parents eventually got a divorce when I was eight. And my brother and I were immediately indoctrinated into a military upbringing. My stepfather was a military man, and he raised us with strict military discipline. Dress code, room inspection, chores, no blue jeans except for Friday, no television except for the weekends. So it was very regimented. And I tell you, man, I really had a hard time. You know, I didn't know at the time, but I was a traumatized child. War. Escape from genocide. Left for dead. Refugee camps. Racism. So you could see how I really had a hard time with this level of discipline. At that point in my life, I was a weak, defeated child traumatized to my childhood traumas. But this all changed when I was nine years old. My mother came to my room and gave me a box. It was a departing gift from my father. Since my parents divorced, I couldn't speak to my father, so this was the final gift. And within the contents of this box, there were four VHS tapes. There were dub tapes written in Vietnamese. I couldn't read Vietnamese at the time, so I randomly pulled out a tape and I threw it into the VCR. It was the art of Budo, the combat side of being samurai. Iaido the way a sword in mine, Bushito, the way to warrior and the seven virtues which governs the way. Compassion, duty, honor, respect, loyalty, justice, courage, the virtues of Bushido. It's crazy to think how an ancient code of ethics can set up the framework for a powerful purpose. Who in here believes in living with a powerful purpose? Yeah. All right, I got a question for you. Do we dream big or do we live to be realistic? Dream big. Or do we live to play it safe? Hmm? What I learned is, you know, as a child, we had big dreams. And as we get, and as we mature, we begin to form doubt based on other people's narratives and their opinions. The thing is, if you ever want to be anything great, if you ever want to make a difference, then it starts by letting go of the survivor's mind that cares what other people think. The survival instincts that were handed down to us over 200,000 years of human evolution. A primitive mind that seeks survival, comfort, Conforming to the institution and the conditions of our upbringing. See, you, in today's world, you ever want to be anything great? You ever want to be anything more than who you are today? Then it starts with dreaming big. 
and living by a set of values that transcends past the Bible. Through your actions, backed by discipline, you can begin to reprogram this primitive mind to evolve and experience what it means to live full. So at nine years old, I didn't understand any of that, okay? <laughs> I just thought being a samurai was cool. And, but it was the Bushido code that led me to my higher path. So fast forward that, I was 16, and I was running with a 45-pound backpack on because I was trained to one day try out for the Special Forces. I was taking my pain and I was fueling it into purpose. The Special Forces Green Beret motto is De Oppressa Librera, to free the oppressed. From oppressed man to free man. So as a free man, I choose to go back. And my pain that I felt in my traumas is now fueling me to a higher path. 18 years old, I joined the Army. Started off my career with the 82nd Airborne Division. Then I served with the Long Range Amphibious Reconnaissance Teams. Then I tried out for the Special Forces, and by 21, I was on the Special Forces A teams. The Special Forces Green Berets are masters at unconventional warfare. There are nine primary missions. Direct action, hostage rescue, reconnaissance. Weapons of mass destruction, recovery. True. <laughs> and so on. On the teams, we had a saying. You never lived until you almost died. And for those who fought for it, life has a flavor that the protected would never know. I started my careers on the A-teams in Okinawa, Japan. Being a four-deployed Special Forces Battalion, you are the crisis response force for the continent of Southeast Asia. Back in 98, the biggest threat to America in Southeast Asia was North Korea's Nodong ballistic missiles that could reach out and touch America. It's crazy how things haven't changed, right? As a Green Beret, I traveled the world and cross-trained with different commando forces. To fight for the people, we had to live with the people. And I got to experience the world. During the global war, our country leaned heavily on the special forces and the teams deployed throughout the world to combat terrorism. My global war year started in the Philippines. Philippines is a channel islands connecting down south into Indonesia. Our team was deployed into the southern region of the Philippines to combat Abu Sayyaf. Abu Sayyaf is a Al-Qaeda terrorist affiliated group that seeks the independent Muslim state. And they did this through threats, murders, bombings, beheadings, assassinations. They will fund their terrorist organizations through human trafficking, drugs, slavery. After working with a few years with the Filipino commandos, we were able to suppress the further spread of Abu Sayyaf in Southeast Asia. And then I moved on to the wars in the Middle East. It was there when I realized just how far I'm willing to go for my purpose. In 2005, I was fighting a war in Iraq. At this stage of the war, Saddam has been captured and handed over to the Iraqi government. This removal of power brought in a new reign of terror as Sir Cowie and his army of Syrian foreign fighters set up sleeper cells in resistance to military occupation. Through low vis reconnaissance, intelligence led us to this Al Qaeda terror safe house. This terrorist group has been behind multiple bombings, beheadings, and a rise in insurgency against U.S. troops 
and the attacks against our homeland. Under night vision, we moved in to contain and isolate the target building. An explosive breaching charge quietly placed on the hidden side of the door. Stacked at the breach, we waited for the command to execute. Execute is the command given by the assault commander. A command to initiate the explosives followed by speed and death as we enter and kill our enemies. Understand, in a close quarters gunfight, one or the other is going to die fighting for what they believe. It was there that I saw the speed of death and just how fragile life actually is. Some of my closest friends has asked me, what was my biggest takeaway from war? What I learned? For me, it was the willingness to die fighting for what I believed in. Fushido, the way to warrior. Are you willing to die for what you believe in? That is the way to warrior. See, purpose backed by pain is such a powerful thing. But the thing about purpose is this. It's focus driven. You know, at one point in my life, my focus was more on my addictions to painkillers. Drugs I used to numb me from the emotions of war and lost teammates. During the Iraq war, I was injured by IED. Improvised explosive device, a rose eyeball. And for my injuries, they prescribed me Oxycontin. And I was immediately hooked. I felt in the euphoric of the drug that it numbed me from my pain of war loss, regret. It numbed me so well that I became a drug addict. The thing about <clears throat> Oxycontin, it's such a powerful drug, and it has a quick way of just pulling you straight to the bottom. At the tail end of my career, I was fighting the wars in Africa. Bahar Uram was a Al Qaeda affiliated terrorist group. They would fund poachers to come in and kill wildlife to fund their training camps. And along with that, they would kidnap women and children and sell them into the human trafficking trade. I tell you, man, at, at that stage of my life, I saw the worst in humanity. And the sight, sound, and smell of war was forever burned into every crevice of my soul. I was a drug addict, barely holding my marriage together. After 23 years of service, 27 countries, and 15 years of war. I retired as a decorated Green Beret with no purpose. I 
Where do you go after you freed the oppressed? When you live that life at that intensity and that speed, where do you go? For me, I went to bed. I was so tired. I barely had enough energy to do anything else. Laying in a dark room became a thing for me. At that point in our lives, my wife was working as a manager in the corporate world, and she would come home seeing that I haven't even moved since she left that morning. At first, I thought I was really tired, but then I quickly found out I was depressed. In my home, I have a dedicated room I call my war room, and it has all my army stuff in there, and antiques and souvenirs from all around the world. And there's a collection of samurai philosophy books. One in particular was by Miromoto Masashi, a ronin born in the late 1500s and died in 1645 after writing the Book of Five Rings and the 21 Principles of Doku Do, The Art of Walking Alone. Masashi was a master swordsman, a philosopher, a gardener, an artist, and a warrior who walked the path of Bushido. What I admire the most about Masashi where he was truly unconventional. Self-taught in the way of dual swords, Ishi Ru. He studied patterns, terrain, angles, distance, and timing to the enemy. Very special forces and mindset. So there I was, you know, a few months after my retirement. I was sitting around in a dark house in a dark room watching a TV that was off. Until one day, I heard my inner voice said, get up. So I did. And I walked around this dark house. Until I ended up in my war room. The front of the ancient writings of a ronin. And these ancient writings brought me back to the code of Bushido, the way of the warrior. And the seven virtues which governs the way. Compassion, duty, honor, respect, loyalty, justice, courage. Courage. So I mustered as much courage as I had in me, and I dumped all the pain meds. And I suffered for many months through the pains of withdrawals, It was a dark time in my life. But I tell you, no matter how hard it got for me during my healing years, my discipline, I still managed to get up early and I built a strong, powerful morning routine. A routine I used as a weapon to propel myself to a powerful day. I started mindfulness meditation. Inhaling in, exhaling out the emotions on the pause of each exhale to separate emotion from thought. See, I was really working on myself. I was that guy who would run on the treadmill at five o'clock in the morning, listen to some podcast between two doctors talking about neuroscience. along with working on myself, roughly around that same time, I said, hey, why not be an entrepreneur? (laughs) 
I mean, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. The Special Forces are masters of unconventional warfare. You sit in a 12-man A-team, and we will train armies. Armies that can quickly organize, cut off line of communications, contain and isolate and overthrow a country. So I figured, how hard would training civilians be? <laughs> so that's where it started. It started with my wife and I traveling across America, training law-abiding citizens so they could better protect themselves and their family. I was taking my pain and turning it to purpose. And along with that, I had to heal my emotional traumas. You know, war doesn't make you kind. So I wanted to be kind. So I started practicing kindness. I would show up to public places and compliment and hold doors open for complete strangers. That was really hard for me. But I kept at it because I wanted to be kind. And in time, I became kind. So, the thing is this, in time I became kind, and in the process I found myself in others, a oneness with all things. My day would start at 4 a.m., and it's still ongoing to this day. Meditation, fitness, health. And along with working on myself, I would help my wife run our company. I tell you, when I was in service, I was gone all the time. During the global war years, I was gone 10 months out of the year. So it's truly a blessing to be able to spend every moment with my wife. And along with that, I'm, I have a team of engineers that I'm able to take my 23 years of military experience and design, engineer, manufacture, and distribute tactical gear. Tactical gear that's being utilized by some of the most elite special operation forces in the world. Pain into purpose. During the global war, we had to find, fix, and kill some of the world's most wanted men. And in the process, I had to learn low vis reconnaissance, which involved photography and videography. I was that guy taking a picture of a bad guy's house over 2,000 meters away, hovering from a skid of a helicopter. I would drill a hole in the side of the vehicle door so I can install pinhole cameras so I can get intelligence and atmospherics of an area of interest. I would take a picture of the bad guy's face, crop it, compress it, encrypt it, and send it over through satellite comms. When my wife and I first started our company, I utilized that same training to take a picture of my products crop it, compress it, and post it onto my website. <laughs> and as my wife and I would travel across America, I would manipulate the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO of a digital SOR. I will hand that camera over to my wife, and she'll record me, teach a class. And later on, I'll take that video edit it and post it through my social media platforms. And now, we have millions of fans from all around the world following us. 
You know, I tell you, it's truly fulfilling being able to build a brand with my wife. A brand that represents who I am, my martial arts, my philosophy, weapons, and my love for world culture. A brand that eventually became a video game character. And this February, Ronin, my video game character, made it to the cover of Call of Duty. Ronin is a downloadable video game character. And he runs around this digital world called Warzone. Players from all around the world will drop in as their avatar into this virtual reality world. Ronin will have these two samurai swords who will run around and chop up other players. <laughs> <laughs> when developing my character, with Infinity Ward, they screen my face and they um, capture my movements. And then they ask me about the Code of Bushido and the teachings of the Five Rings by Miramoto Masashi. You know, guys, it's it's crazy to think how an ancient code of ethics came to me at nine years old, at my weakest point. And it helped shape the person that I was going to become. Now being shared in the most popular video game platform in the world, it's crazy. Pain into purpose. As an entrepreneur, a warrior teacher, and a downloadable video game character. <laughs> Man, it gave me the platform that I needed to speak values to our youth, help our veterans develop communities across America. Pain into purpose. to turn pain into purpose is to know one of the biggest reasons why we're alive. And that's to experience love. Love for yourself, and love for others. I feel in life, love kind of just finds us. It comes to us, and it teaches us an important lesson. See, my wife taught me the meaning of love. She worked, took care of me, and put herself through school, graduating with a master's degree in business and accounting. I would have to wear earplugs, right, in her college years because she would stay up late at night typing away at some term paper at 3 o'clock in the morning. She would start a new career. Every few years as the army moves us across the world. We were dating at the time America was attacked, and she endured all of my war years. She worried sick. As the teams continued to continuously deploy throughout the years. And after my war years, when I found myself broken, she was there picking up the broken pieces. Her love for me 
became my light. And a light I use as a weapon to propel myself out of my darkest places. She is the driving force behind Ronin Tactics, an industry dominated by men. She is a successful female. I'm proud of my wife. Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud of my wife and all of our accomplishments. She's a role model to entrepreneurs, donates her time to help our veterans, military law enforcement. Truly blessed to have her be able to travel all through America with me as I train our Americans to better safeguard themselves and their communities. But I'll tell you the best part about working with my wife is that I don't only get bossed around at work, I get bossed around at home too. <laughs> hey guys, I want to share with something. Today is our 23 year anniversary. <laughs> Happy anniversary, honey. So, it was my greatest challenges that led me to my biggest lessons. The pain that I had to feel was just to get me to where I needed to be. But that doesn't come without wounds. So it was up to me to heal myself from the weight that carries. Remember this, guys. That you are the creators of your own reality. And no matter how hard life gets sometimes, we all have a choice. So choose, choose to succeed when the odds are stacked against you. Choose to turn your pain into purpose, your wounds into wisdom, and your actions into kindness. Every one of us here had our own individual journey that got us all here today each hardship and the narrative that, that came out of it further define who we are to become. In this present moment, as we sit within our shadow of pain, thank it, accept it, knowing that light, light, can only be understood through the wisdom of darkness. Today, as we sit under the sun, moon, stars, and heaven, may we connect with the warrior within and attack life, knowing that mistakes and setbacks are a part of it. And within this space of the lion's den, may we take our pain and turn it into purpose. A purpose driven from the highest frequency that created all things. And that is love. Love for its love that would save us all. Remember this. 
one moment can change the day. And one day can change the life. And one life can change the world. God and country. Thank you.